deal. I'm just trying to deal in some more, but uh, it's not a big deal. I, I'll do it another time. Yeah, I'll do it next time. No big deal. Yep, there it is. Oh, it's it is? Up. Oh, good, okay. Right. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Council, uh, Council. I'm Franklin County Commissioner Kevin Boyce, and I'm just so excited to be here. Man, thanks everybody for tuning in again this week. We've had just several weeks of really good discussions. Uh, another week of a brotherly conversation about health, wealth, and race right here in Franklin County. Now, I've had a lot of people come on this, this uh, show, and I got some really good guys this week. I had great guys last week, but I got to say, this is definitely the best looking group that I've had. They're definitely the best looking group. So Thank you. That's right. That's right. Represent, fellas. Represent. Now, I know yes, I'm going to get sir. Mr. Clark who's not here last week, he's going to say something. But nonetheless, uh, he knows it's the truth. He knows the truth. Um, <laughs> it's essential, Ohio. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you tuning in and, and writing me and sending me uh, inboxes on Instagram um, at uh, Commissioner underscore Boyce and on um, Facebook and at Clay Boyce on, um, on my Twitter account. Thank you so much for uh, just sending me your questions, your thoughts, your feedback, your criticism, and all of the things in between. Uh, I'm grateful, uh, but we've got a great show for you, and I'm really excited about these three young men that are on. Let me start with Al Edmondson. First of all, I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourself. Tell the public a little bit about you. I think a lot of people know you, but give the 30-second first, like you, you, you're in the elevator, and you see right. a nice-looking woman. You're a single guy. you got 30 <laughs> seconds. Right. <laughs> yeah. Get that, yeah. You got something to her to keep her attention, and then you go. You, you got to move on from there. So you got thirty seconds to do your thing. But before I start with you, Al, I got to know you're a barber, owner, businessman. How's my cut looking today, man? Am I? Am I, am I uh, I, yeah, I, you good for the day? I'm good for the day. You're good okay. for the day. I'm, yeah. All right. That's why. Yeah. So. Good. That's why. Yeah. So. Me. You ready? Uh, yeah, my name is. My name is Al Edmondson, owner of a Cutter Brother Rest Barbershop on uh, Money Earning Mount Vernon in the King Lincoln District. Also, I run a nonprofit called Making a Difference, which helps stabilize the family unit right here in the city of Columbus. We've done back to school rallies. We've done health initiatives. Uh, we continue to do things to help improve the community. And also, I'm the president of the Mount Vernon District Improvement Business Association, where uh, we help the businesses in the King Lincoln District stabilize and provide resources through city programming and making sure we um, help them out during this pandemic time. And so I'm just glad to be here, Kev, and thank you for the invite. And I do a lot of many other things. You can Google me at Al Edmondson <laughs> and, and find all the rest. But uh, I'm just very thankful to be able to uh, allow God to use me in my community. Yeah. Uh, is that is that a nonprofit? Is is that, yeah, uh, yeah. that nonprofit you got? Yeah, it's called Making yeah. a Difference. Yeah, yeah, Making a Difference. Man, I owe you a check, don't I? If I yeah. remember correctly, you did. <laughs> I never sent that check, man. Look. Y'all got me on public live right now. I'm saying I owe this man a check. I will give you something. You gotta stay on me about that, but I'll definitely get you something, man. I like I, I like, it. What you, like what you represent. All right, all right, Mr. Carter, it's on you now. Well, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Commissioner Boyce. And first of all, I'm gonna just point to my ring and say, babe, I'm ex I'm following the rules <laughs> of the well, No, what did you say to her? Tell us what you <laughs> said to her then. What would you say to your wife? Well, I'm gonna act like I'm talking to her. My name right. is LaShawn Carter. I'm from the east side of Columbus, uh, born and raised, graduated from Independence High School. You know, I'm currently the assistant director of Franklin County Children's Services. I also have the privilege of serving as the chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. And that, hey, that's good. I, hey, I date, I date you on that one, man. That's good. That was really good. All right, break us home, Terry. Let, let's hear it, man. Uh, so for me, my quick 30 seconds, uh, my name is Terry Green founder and executive director of Think Make Live Youth uh, nonprofit here in Columbus, Ohio. What we do is we work with young people that have been affected by the justice system, the foster care system, or at risk, and connecting them to resources so they can thrive through their challenging situations. Man, that's perfect. All, all three, three, three strikes, we in there. Good job. <laughs> or I should say three home runs, rather. Um, but let's dig right into it, guys. I mean, there's been so much going on. 
uh, 2020 has been, I don't know what kind of year we would call it if there was a name for it, but it's been a year of something else. But, but the reality is, is that even though we've been a part of a global pandemic, we all know that there was a pandemic before the pandemic. And it was it's really about race in America. Now I'm talking to three young black men, successful black men. Give me, tell me your experience out there. Tell me your greatest experience with racism. Where, you know, were you stopped by the police ever in a situation you didn't feel was appropriate? Tell me like a, an experience. I, let me start with mine. You know, and I, I'll be real quick about it. Um, you know, I remember my first day when I was chief of staff in the House of Representatives. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and for, for, for all those listening, you know, you always have to look at the undertones of comments and things, you know, because that's how we feel as black people often. But I remember my first day, I was chief of staff in the House of Representatives. Now I was a young guy, I was probably, I don't know, 26 or so, and had got promoted to this position over the years. And I was going to work my first day at the job and it was, um, I was on the 14th floor, my office was on the 14th floor in the Rice Center. And I get on the elevator and, uh, and it was a, a very nice white, older white lady who said to me, um, how you doing, sir? You, you look very, you look dressed up in snazzy today. You, you know, she asked, do you have a job interview? Or are you, you trying to get a job? And, and I said, no, no, ma'am, I, I work here. And she said, you work here? She said, I would have never believed that. And I think it's, it wasn't an all out, you know, um, uh, uh, racist comment, but the undertones were that you're a young black man in a suit in this building, and you, you gotta be going for a job interview. You gotta be going for something. That, that's my lightest story, quite frankly. But, but I wanted uh -huh. to set the tone. So let's start with you, Terry. I know you got a story to share with the public about an experience with racism in your life. Uh, well, one of my, mine is one of the horror stories. I mean, I was, I was a homeless youth right here in Franklin County. Um, so I experienced, you know, at a young age, you know, watching police officers threaten us, you know, jump out, jump boy, you know, to jump out boys at the beginning. So, you know, racism for us was just us being oppressed by, you know, people that's putting in our, in our system to, to help us support us. So we've been seeing that from, you know, from the beginning. And, you know, right here in Franklin County, like I said, at the age of 15 years old, you know, figuring out, navigating different systems, you know, watching, you know, uh, young people at a young age, you know, be, you know, brutally hurt by police officers, um, brutally hurt by, you know, people that, you know, and it's, it's just, it's crazy because a scenario even, um, and I'm not even going to speak about myself too, I'm going to speak about uh, one of a young person told me, he said, you know, this is a 13 year old, he said, when does it become where police officers, you know, where back in the day I heard when a police officer come to the community, you can wave hi at them, but now, you know, police officers come to our community and they ask us to lift off our shirt and see if we got any guns. Like, right. so, age of 13, 12 years old, you know, we are we being racially, racially profiled to even have guns within our own communities as young ages. So I didn't experience all of that um, at, a, at a beginning age of 13, 14, 15 years old right here in Franklin County. LaShawn, I know you got a story like that, man. You know, uh, tell us what, what your experience has been. Um, I'll, I'll start my first experience, my earliest experience with racism was at nine years old at East Haven Elementary School in the playground. Um, I'll never forget it. It was after school, we was playing and um, a 13 to 14 year old white kid was, was also there. And um, he called me the N word and spit in my face. I can still smell the marble red saliva in my eyes. But um, that was when I was nine. That was my first real experience. I mean, I've heard it, I heard about it but that was my first direct experience. Um, since then, I mean, I've had unfortunate interactions with the law. My first time uh, experiencing driving while black was on refugee road headed to Eastland Mall. And the first time that uh, a member of law enforcement uh, drew his weapon on me was I was working third shift at DFAS in the mail room uh, while I was in college. It was my sophomore year in college. Uh, I went to Ohio State. And so I was working third shift and you know, if you know anything about the Department of Defense, it's in it's in Whitehall. Mm -hmm. And so because I worked third shift, time. our lunchtime was like two or three o'clock in the morning. And so I leave to go to lunch and um, I'm driving through the neighborhood, Robinwood uh, 
uh, Robinwood was the street I was on, and a, a police officer pulled me over in the middle of the night and um, thought I was casing the neighborhood, pulled his weapon on me. I had to literally beg him to just reach in my pocket and pull out my badge that showed that I worked at DFAS so he could know that I had a reason to be in that neighborhood at two or three o'clock in the morning. And he did it, pulled it out, and he was all apologetic once he picked me up. But by then, I go back to work. I'm all dirty. They're like, what happened to you? I'm like, I got roughed up by the cops. And, that was and the wrong. mental trauma, and the mental trauma stays with you. You know, it, it just it sticks with you. I'm going I'm to ask my man Al uh, for his experience. But before we do that, let me give a quick shout out to school board member James Ragland, who's watching us today. I appreciate you joining me today, brother. Uh, Ken Wilson, our uh, Franklin County um, Board of Commissioners Administrator. I uh, appreciate you joining in each week. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Charity Martin, I see you you back. And, and again, I want to have Charity on at some point. Yeah, yeah everybody, everybody giving her waves. Everybody know Charity. You, you know, you don't give her a wave. She's going to say something. She's going to text you right now. Uh, and, um, and then we got, you know, staff, the Franklin County Board of Commissioners. And I want to just ask people out there watching, share this link, share folks, because we want we want everybody to hear what these young men have to say uh, and, and what they're doing to impact Central Ohio. Al, what about your experience, my friend? You gotta unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so uh, my mine started when I was about 21, driving home from work, working at the Hyatt on Capitol Square. I got over to police because I didn't have my front tag on. And so I had a jaywalking ticket because um, I used to park cars back in the day at the Hyde on Tap Square. So they end up arresting me. They took me down to the Franklin County Jail and I emptied my pockets. I was 10 cents short of paying my uh, fine. And they locked me up. They put me in the jumper, had me stripped down, put me in a jumper and put me in the smallest cell. And I felt at that time, I didn't, I didn't really realize what was really going on at that time. But I'm like, man, you know, I'm going to end up like some of my friends. Um, and, you know, I had nobody to really call to come and get me. So I had to stay there overnight. And, um, and finally, they let me go so I can go home. And then we came back and forth. But that was my first experience. And um, as a young man, 19, just got back home from school for the, for the summer, um, I didn't think I was ever going to go back. Um, because, of I, you, know, my, uh, you know, growing up in a project, a lot of my friends are already in. And I'm sitting here like, man, I'm about to be the next one in with them just with yeah. a jaywalking ticket. And so I was, I was, you know, I tried to be cool and be like everybody else and smoke a cigarette, man, and that thing blew my head up so bad because I ain't hey. a smoker. <laughs> man, I was walking around with a headache and mad. So, and <laughs> them bologna sandwiches wasn't good. <laughs> look, look I, I've never tried uh, any kind of cigarettes or anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about that, man. So, yeah. Right, yeah. So, right. you know, everybody got cigarette, man. So you're like, yo, man, you're trying to be, you're trying to blend in. Hey, bro, let me get well. I'm like, <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah, man. I don't smoke I, to the day. So, <laughs> thank you. Well, well you know, I, mean, I, I think your experiences really tell uh, a part of the mosaic of stories that many African American men have to face in communities all across America. But a lot's been happening in 2020. I mean, we got the pand pandemic, but I think the uh, tragic death of George Floyd really set off a conversation in America and not just a conversation, but a reaction in America that things seem a little different, good, bad, or indifferent, it's different. And so Terry, let me start with you. You know, how are you feeling about today where we are in this conversation given the, the death of George Floyd? I mean, tell me about the folks you interact with and, and how are you just feeling as a black man in America today? Hopeful, not so much hopeful, doubtful, indifferent well i mean kevin as you know and al and and lasan y'all know me uh, I, you know I've, I've been already doing the social justice work before this even this mm -hmm. even happened so to me you know one of the statements that's always has been said in a lot of these protests and marches is that this is not just a moment but this is an actual movement right you're not looking at just because of this death as being some form of moment in time where we're just gonna put pause but we're gonna continuously, for those that continue to be doing work, really move out into the movement. And so for me, I feel like right now we're in a place, it's, it's just a, it's a, a shift 
right? Because we got young people that are standing up there that's protesting that they never protested in their life. This is their first time ever protesting. They're protesting the first time ever given a chance to say and speak out on the injustice that they've, they've been seeing and experienced, not only for themselves, but also for their peers. There's some young people that's just having a secondary uh, racial experience experience and you gotta think about those young people that's been that's privileged that, that uh, in communities that are seeing racism in different forms right and you got those people now that are standing up that there's at a radical rage that want to see some form of change and i i believe that now is these this new generation right now is, is on a, a different fire and they're not letting up right and they're not letting up and to be able to uh see that right now that there is a, a true shift that w right now with there's funding being poured all types of places, government, corporate companies putting billions and million dollars in all these different types of, you know, organizations and, and grants and different types of things that comes when it comes to racial justice. But I think that the underlying to it that we really need to wake up and really believe that and see and see black people, African American people as human beings, right? And acknowledging that. That's the thing that, that we, that as, as people in America and as, as, as history is put in place is that we have been second class citizens. And so we need to, to stand up for the, the, to the fact that we are human beings and that there are rights as, 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 as civil rights, our, our rights as human rights, our rights uh, for, our, for all justice. And so I believe that the young people right now is on a radical rage that is, is not letting up. You know, I've been out in, in many different protests and I've seen you out there uh, getting maced up and, and being out there too on the forefront, but in the same sense, being out there realizing that, you know, people don't, we're not, you know, we're in a different time, right? We're yeah. in a different time. I was watching a video, and one of the videos said that the civil rights movement, it took a few months for them to rally up to come out uh, and get those people to come out march. But in a couple of days, it took it, millions of people all over the United States, young people uh, from all different ages, races, and, and ethnics is coming out and standing up for justice. And so, so what I feel like I hear you saying though is you feel hopeful. You feel you yeah. feel like this is a, a new oh, chapter yeah. in the day. That's oh, great. Yeah. That that because that's you know, and, and we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna challenge you guys on this a little bit later, but uh, but that's really good. You know, Al or, or Sean, how do you how are you feeling about how do you feel? about what right the time we're in is it different or is this the same and i know al I, I don't know how old you are but al i know you were around when rodney king uh we we all right. saw that out nationally and and for a minute you know yeah. it was an uproar and a pushback and things seemed like they were shifting and then it went back to the same if not worse so one of you guys al sean what what's what, what yeah. you I, I heard, um this is something different right now um, I believe um, this right here is something a little different um, because it's a movement. You got people all around the country that they're, they, you know, George Floyd didn't know he was going to die as a murderer, but hey, this thing is deep and it's yeah. deeper because we, you know, we as people, we're tired of getting disenfranchised. We're tired of getting the worst of the housing. We're tired of getting the worst of food. We're tired of getting the um, getting money taken from us through our small businesses and stuff. So right now, um, I feel that a lot of positivity is going to come out of it. But at the end of the day, uh, what next? You know, once the marching is gone, once there's all the pro, you know, the marching, the protest, all the and Netflix and stuff is gone. What next? And so we've been having these discussions about economics. Um, um, we, we're doing something later on today. It's called dollar and cents with some pastors and churches yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And we're trying to let people know that your your dollar ma uh, matters, and how you spend your money matters too. And that's the only thing they they understand is that dollar. So after we're done with all of this, the zoom in about the, all these systemic racism that's in corporate America and all across the country, we our dollars matter. And so when we start to move that needle, just like yesterday, a lot of people felt that. You know that um, uh, Tuesday event that we did, Blackout Tuesday. Yeah, yep, yep. And so, you know, and and then also uh, one of the things that's happening right now that I'm talking to with my corporate people is that systemic racism in corporate America. That's deep, because one guy was sharing a story on how if you're a white male, you might get a raise, but if you're a black male, you're not getting a raise. You got to work longer hours. That's something wrong with that picture. 
We on the same pay scale, but if because you're white, because that's the white privilege, right? You'll get a raise because, and your hours may even reduce because you got a family. I got a family. I got to work twice as hard. What's wrong? What's wrong with that picture? My thing is that, like I said in the Channel 10 interview, I bleed like you bleed. You know, I'm not this color for a reason, but I bleed like you bleed. I work just as hard to make uh, my family uh, what it is today and doing the best I can to provide for them. And I want the same opportunities that you have. Absolutely. But you feel hopeful, though. You, you feel you feel too yeah. like Harry that, yeah. you know, this it's different. This feels different of what's happening in our country right now. Right. 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 I think it's a great opportunity around uh, commissioner to um, put some things on paper. You know all about legislation and that stuff. We've got to put some stuff down on paper. Um, it is definitely a great opportunity. And, I, you know, like right now. I think I think Al, we lost you. Al, you might have to hang up and come back in, Al. I think I can pick up kind of where you're yeah, yeah, going. Go ahead. Yeah. How you um, feel? I'm I, so. I am also one that recognizes. Um, the, I'm a child of the '70s, so I recognize the 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 pattern. Um, what I think is different is that. Um, the murder of George Floyd has been a catalyst for uh, change in a way that can bring about some racial atonement or reconciliation. And what, what comes from that is our collective ability to work together in, in quite specific and anti-racist ways. And, yeah. and I know Commissioner Voice, you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again, is that the, the same intentionality that went behind the creation of the system of oppression is required to dismantle it. Racism has penetrated every system that uh, makes up our society. And the intentionality for that for pervasive existence is required to dismantle it, meaning we have to take intentional and sustainable action to eradicate the influence that racism has had on not only our government, but also our private sector and even our nonprofit environment. We have to make very real and intentional steps. We have to include the voices of those that have been historically marginalized. And we have to include the, the voices of our young people because they will inherit this world. And so I think our responsibility is to have a collective conversation, a collective dialogue, but most importantly, collective action. Because I think that's what's going to sustain a change. And I think that's where Al was headed in terms of understanding of law and legislation but also understanding of policy and procedure and how those things get put into practice. And, th and that requires us to have conversations, not only like this one, but also conversations in the boardrooms that we occupy. That, has, that means having conversations in our neighborhoods. That means having conversations with our own family. That means us going to our, our white allies and peers and encouraging them to challenge the perspectives that are said in private that often spill into public in more subtle and microaggressive ways. And so I think it's important that we have all of these conversations because we need to take advantage of this moment and take some big swings that change because we're in a moment in time where everyone's eyes are on it. And I think because of that, we can take advantage of that momentum and, and lead towards a trajectory that is ultimately gonna lead us to true change. Man, I, I like what you're saying. That if, uh, if you see me giving a speech over the next couple of weeks and you hear me use some of them lines, don't, I, don't, I want you to call me out and say, I got that from you. Uh, that, that was really good, man, and very thoughtful. Uh, let me give a shout out to my man, Al Bannister. That's my frat brother uh, who's tuned in from Toledo watching us. Good to see you, uh, brother. Thanks for joining in. Um, I, I think you both touched on something that I want to take a, a deeper dive in. You know, I mean, the, this hope is good. And at the end of the day, you know, we as elected officials have limited powers, limited resources. You know, you can't legislate morality. You know, change starts with individuals. It starts with you, Terry. It starts with you, Sean. It starts with me. It starts with all the white people you know. And, you know, I, I do feel like there is a, a, a difference in today, a difference in today. But, but I'm often asked, and I want to hear what you guys got to say. I'm often asked from people, sit, sit and I'm often asked from people, um, white people, what can I do? What can I personally do? And I've had corporate leaders ask me this. I've had um, uh, clergy, white leaders ask me this. 
I've had my neighbors ask me this. Has anyone asked you that? And if they haven't, if they would, what would you say? Either one of you, whoever oh, wants man. to. Uh, Terry, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this one really quickly, then you can jump in because, <laughs> um, so I, there's two, two, there's two thing, ways to think about it for me. One is <clears throat> engagement and how do you encourage someone to stay engaged, particularly when you are uncomfortable. Um, and and what, what's true about this is that it, this is an uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people. But the, I think the responsibility of our white friends and our allies is that we encourage them to do two things. One, to stay engaged in the conversation, but then secondly, they need to lean into that discomfort. They need to experience it and, and truly reflect on what it feels like to be uncomfortable because he, he, although they can never walk in the shoes of a person of color, um, that discomfort that they can shy away from, they can experience it firsthand if they lean into it when it arrives. And I think what, what's also true about that is if we encourage our allies and our peers to remain engaged, what we also do is we hold them accountable to be a part of the change. And we don't allow for them to retreat when it gets a little bit uncomfortable because the reality is when they retreat, they leave the responsibility to pick up the pieces to those that are historically marginalized and oppressed. And I think the, the truth of the matter is, is that racism was a system that was created by the ancestors that they inherited this world from. And, and, and it's gonna require their effort along with ours to dismantle it. And so that, re, that, re, that means that when we are having these conversations, they need to speak their truth and they need to also listen to understand from us as we are telling them the stories of how we've been impacted by the society. And then lastly, we, we, we need to start imposing our will on the situation and, and not in the ways that we traditionally think of imposition, but more so in the recognition that, you know, we are the ones that we are waiting for, right? We are the change that we've been waiting for. And so it's gonna require us to insert ourselves in spaces where we have traditionally tried to shy away from because they make us uncomfortable. We have yeah. to be more specific about how we get involved. I think you hit it. So, so Al can start prepare for the question. But the question was, you know, when when I've been asked a lot by white my white friends, what can I do? And so I want to know what would you say if you were asked? That? I'm gonna go to Terry and then come and give you a second to think about that. Um, but I want to I'll throw this in the mix of that question, guys. Um, you know, and I'm just I'm, I'm being you know hypothetical here. You know. Um, if you are considered a part of the quote unquote elite privileged race, do you really want to give that up? Do you really, you know, is it, I mean, you, you said, you know, do the right thing. You know, if, 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 if I'm, you know, um, I mean, you know, it may sound good to say, um, yeah, we should be equality. We should, everything should be equal. We should be on the same level, but do you really want to, you know, uh, give up your sort of elitism, if you will, um, and I'm just throwing that in there. You know, I, I had I had someone ask me that the other day, and and I said, I mean, that's interesting. You know, but but Terry, uh, tell me your thoughts. And we will come back. To you, I'm gonna give you. I want to give you a second to get back. And then if you guys are short to answer, we we'll, we got about another 33 minutes, so we got yeah, a lot. I, of I, I don't got too much to say because I mean, let's, let's somehow I kind of put both of my things on the nose. I want. I just want to say is we gotta acknowledge. That that white supremacy exists. Like in the same sense that we got to dismantle that and in the same sense is you have to acknowledge and you have to be accountable in terms of one's, of their own racial bias. See, in the same sense, they sometimes people are so generational influenced, right? And now we're in a time where even some people that was generational influenced mm -hmm. want to break those generational whether the generational cycle of us believing the white in white supremacy and living out in white supremacy and and now to where we have those young people now that says listen i'm against that and i want to see change in, in human rights and all rights right and so i think that us like in, investing into the fact of really acknowledging and being accountable holding people holding them accountable Holding them accountable of really having those discussions, really getting those, those uncomfortable spaces, right? It's because we have to get in uncomfortable spaces all the time. We always have, always will, and always been pushing through. And so it's now it's time, like, this is a space where it's like, 
and said that the door is open. Everybody's ears are open to it. And now that your ears are open, what are the things that you can do? And how can you be accountable? And if the one thing is the two is being acknowledged of your own biases and, and, and being aware of those, and then two, making the, the right um, you know, steps afterwards to, you know what I'm saying, to make change, I think that's how we, we truly going to see some form of change. And then three is is, is an investment into black owned businesses and blessing to companies. And you know, I saw we said blackout Tuesday. It should be blackout every day, every single day. It should be black out. We should be blacking out all the way till we can't black out no more. It should be blackout, black out, black out, black out, black out, black out, black out till you can't yeah. stop. Right? Because at the end of the day, it's time for us to even right now, if you think about it, and I know I gotta end on this, but right here we are in even in the economic despair. Right here in Franklin County, we got multi-billionaires living right next to somebody that, that can't even get a, a sandwich or a dollar, right? Right here in our own communities. So when we think about talking about the despair of racial, we talk, we talk about the economic despair too that needs to be shifted and changed too, right here in Franklin County. Yeah, let, let's go to one of our own local billionaires, Al Edmondson. You know, Al, oh, Al, oh, okay, Al, thank you. Thank thank you. Right um, yeah, but but, yeah. but, but, I, but I want to echo what LaShawn said and also my brother Chad Green, man. Those were both where I'm at right now. But just to add a little bit more to it is that now what's happening, I think this next generation, they get it because guess what? We live in your neighborhoods now. Mm -hmm. We go to school with you now. We couldn't used to go to Whitehall, Reynoldsburg, Gahanna, Upper Arlington, and all those places before. But now, guess what? We can live there now. Or New, and New Albany, we can live there now. So now, your sons and daughters, we're playing together. We're growing up together. So now we got relationships. Most of those people didn't have contact with us until uh, segregation. You know, going to East High School, I remember when they brought Clintonville, the bottom, all that to East. I was a part of that movement. And it was uncomfortable at that time because yeah, being yeah. right here on the east side, you know, during those times, I mean, some of those guys got, you know, things happen, you know, but we learned to get along as freshmen all the way through our senior years where, you know, we're best of friends now. And so they get it because I've gotten tons of calls from my uh, former classmates about this whole thing. And they need to have those conversations with their, with their people and their peers and even their children. You know, um, because, you know, the TV doesn't give us any justice. Uh, the commercials sometimes don't give us any justice. And the system, the court system doesn't give, it, give us any justice in some cases. Um, and so we need to continue to build upon the success of what's going on right now. And I'm definitely in agreement with Terry. We need to have Black Friday, Black Tuesday, Black mm -hmm. Saturday every day. We should support our business, but we also have to hold our businesses accountable for offering good service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, don't y'all you know, hit the nail. It's crazy because the greatest description, I mean, there are disparities uh, across the board on just about every category, but the greatest disparity is wealth. And, you know, to I, I love the point that Terry said, I'm going to tell you, invest in, uh, you know, as a white company, as a white business, invest in black businesses, help them. And, and it's not, you're not, it's not a handout. You know, it, it's, it's quite frankly a hand up because as, as the tide rises, all boats rise. And I, I really believe in that concept. And so, um, you know, it, 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 in, in that though, embedded in that, we have so many challenges, you know. Um, African-American men make up 6% of the population of the state of Ohio, yet we make up nearly 50% of our correctional institutions. African-American men are on the bottom rung and nearly every social uh, determinant area that you can think of. Um, Health care, education, housing, wealth distribution. You know, um, the census is something that comes along every 10 years. And, and we count the people who live in your community and it's people who live in community, not citizens, it's residents. And by doing that, we distribute resources and funds um, ranging from small business uh, loans and, and resources and grants to social service resources to medical medical care to uh, money for our schools. Tell me in a nutshell how important the census is and the people talk about your own organizations and how the census impacts the people that you serve. And I, I'll just let you guys jump out to whoever wants to take it first. Well, I can start first because uh, I think the census right now was definitely this neighborhood right here as it continues to grow and be gentrified. 
Um, it definitely will help our schools. It definitely will help our businesses. And um, it definitely will help just the area in its whole um, to bring people back to the neighborhood because people want something to come back to. Because often, often think about infrastructure. And that's one thing that, you know, your lights, your sewage, those things are very important in neighborhoods in the beginning to make sure the infrastructure is right when you start building these um, malls or shopping centers and so forth. And I think our schools can always use help. Um, I'm a I'm a product of Columbus Public Schools from Champion to Middle Schools, Sun Garden, Cassidy, East High School. And and I think our schools can use a lot more help with the resources. And um, I, I think it that, you know, the resources that will help provide um, definitely uh, Wi-Fi to our neighborhood right now, because with, you know we don't know what the school year is going to look like coming up, and Wi-Fi is def definitely necessary for our communities. So making sure that if these young men and women have to work from home, that they have proper Wi-Fi and you know laptops and things they can have to continue their education. And um, I think that's just something that is very important uh, in our community. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you hit the nail on the head with the schools. I mean, at the end of the day, our progress is rooted in our future. And the future are the students who are being educated to serve in leaderships to, in positions tomorrow, to serve as our teachers, our doctors, our business people. And so that investment to me is the greatest return. That's the, the greatest ROI is within our school. Think about it. $34 billion comes to uh, the state of Ohio annually based on census numbers, $34 billion. And of that, you know, it was broken down into pots. And I, I, I don't know about you guys, but um, I came from a family who grew up accessing public resources. And mm -hmm. if not for those resources, it could have been the difference between us making it and not making it. And it's a lot of families out there to this day that need those resources, but we have to be counted to get our fair share. Now, let me do a quick shout out to Kwesi Kambone, who's watching, Ahmed Ali, thanks for joining me. And then Troy Glover, thanks so much for, for tuning in with us today. Uh, Terry, Sean, what's your what's your thoughts on this census? Well, you know, I know you you serve uh, a population that is undercounted uh, yeah. ultimately. And so tell yeah. me about what that means to your organizations. Yeah. So Commissioner Boyce, I'll I'll I'll, I'll say that um, research has found that a high proportion of young people living, particularly in foster families, were missed or significantly undercounted in the 2010 census. And, and if you couple that with the research that has shown that the same zip codes and neighborhoods are also the most frequently undercounted, um, you can see why completing the census is so important. But what I'll also say is true is that those are the very same neighborhoods where uh, we would also attribute some measure of risk and safety. And, and so, it, I, and I don't think there's any accidents when it comes to the correlations between how we assess risk, how we assess safety, and how we allocate resources. Mm -hmm. And I think what's important for us to consider is by completing the census, we can be more thoughtful about how we allocate resources, how we can support and engage families, and particularly the neighborhoods that are most historically underserved and marginalized. And I think the census is a way to guarantee that. But here's the one thing, we have to reconcile that people don't complete the census because they do not have faith in the government responding in kind to their efforts. So people are not completing the census because they feel disenfranchised and not supported. And, and, and the same reason that people are apathetic towards completing the census is the same energy that is why the booths are not filled during non-presidential elections. We have to localize this understanding and localize the experience so that people understand you completing in this, the completing the census is local activation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you have to do that to on a very intentional level. Go ahead, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I want to add to that because the local activation is the reason why, you know, organizations like mine as a small nonprofit exist. You know, being able to get, I mean, not exist, but being able to get support from government funding, right? So um, uh, primarily our focus on young people that we work with are within the third congressional district right here in, in, in Central Ohio. And we know within the third congressional district that is one of the districts that has the most underserved resources. And so for us to be a nonprofit and for other small nonprofit organizations 
to be able to provide those additional resources, whether it be food, whether it be housing, whether it be uh, supportive services, to be able to you know apply for those those funding resources to support those uh, those people in the community. So I think that it is it very important that people understand that you know there are nonprofit organizations that are, are looking out um, for you know people within you know those communities that you know should go out and and, and make sure they do the census because the census is very important. You know to be able to and like you said not being counted. Uh, and not being able to be in tracking those, those tax dollars and the dollars are going, you know, either one to overflow and where does overflow go to, right? Or two, you know, those resources are going to other communities that, you know, are being, you know, poured in and then becoming gentrified, right? Um, yeah. And you're thinking about all of that. How does the gentrification come and how does all that comes? So all of that comes from this, right? From the, from, from the census. And so, I think that it's very important uh, for people to, to, that's my perspective, I should say. Kevin, can I add one other fact? Yeah, please, yeah, absolutely, jump in. So uh, I just want to make sure people understand that four out of five children not counted on the census lived in families that actually returned the census. So and I'm, when I'm talking about, so this is an uncounted population. When I talk about foster children, they are living in homes where those homes are ultimately responsible for making sure that they get counted. And that includes living with the grandparents, their aunts and uncles, we call that kinship homes. Those children, when they are in your home, particularly for 2020, if they were in your home on August 1st or April 1st of 2020, they should be counted as a part of your household. Mm -hmm. And so um, though in 2010, four out of five children who are in foster placement were not counted even if the residents did complete a census form. And so it's important that we advocate, we ensure that not only are they counted, but I think that goes to the next step. And Commissioner Voice, I know you know what I mean like this, is that they feel like they are part of the family. If they're not being counted on paper, how can we ensure that they're being included as part of the family in person? So we just need to make sure that we are reconciling that, that understanding that being a part of someone's family means you are truly a part of that family in every single way. Yeah, right, the one right. thing, you hit the nail on the head and, and Terry, you said something that really a spurred a thought in, in my mind. It's, and you talked about the third congressional district. The census count also determines the number of congressional representatives we have in Washington. And right now, you know, the, the, the population is growing at a fast rate in the southwestern direction and corridor and in the south direction. And so um, we're competing with states like North Carolina and Georgia, where we may lose a seat and they may gain the seat that we lose. You know, you've got states like Texas and California. They'll pick up additional seats because their population is always growing. And so it's, it, you know, then that means we lose more representation in Washington. And imagine if we didn't have a, a, a Congresswoman Joyce Bay and the difference that she's made over the last decade representing Central Ohio in Washington. And I'm, I should add, she's the first time, it was because the last census that seat was created, she's the first time that Central Ohio or Columbus was represented as one district. Her district essentially mirrors the city of Columbus, basically, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and by the way, Columbus has now outgrown that congressional districts. So the, you know, Columbus in 2010 was about 750,000 people. Today, Columbus is almost over 900,000 people. And so you can't even get it in one congressional district today. And so, I mean, these are, these are gonna be critical things. And once we do it, it lasts, that information lasts the next 10 years. And, and, and the, the one interest one last point, I maybe ask you guys on this too, the, the pandemic, and all of the resources that have flowed to across this country, when you think about how early on in the process, California and New York and Texas were having more testing centers set up quicker, more resources set up quicker, a lot of that is population based. They looked at the densest places with the most population. And if you, if you don't have all your count, then it could even impact your health, life and safety. You know? And so when you think about it, how, how critical that is, um, now, we, we wrap it into the last 15 minutes, and we might have some questions that come in online right about now. So if you're watching, go ahead and send us those um, uh, questions online. But I want to give each of you a couple minutes to talk about your organizations and what you do. You gave us that little thumbnail um, 
elevator speech, you know, um, you know, but tell us a little more about what you do. Terry, I remember the first day you walked into my office and you, you, you came in, you was a little more raw, you were a lot more polished now, brother, but, but you was a little more raw in, but I love your progress, man. I love your progress. People are talking about your organization. People are talking about you. We, we talk about bringing you in the show. It was nothing but positive feedback. So tell, tell folks, give us a, 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 a 35, 45 second um, picture of what you're doing. Tell us a little more about Think Make Live. Yeah, so um, Think Make Live Youth, it actually started off as a, uh, it was a PowerPoint presentation in 2015. I had an opportunity to share my story for a senior humanities class at Ohio State University. Um, and then 2017, I turned that a 20 minute PowerPoint presentation into a nonprofit organization. Uh, 2018, we received our 501c3 status. Uh, and then 2019, we developed two partnerships, one with Opportunity Youth United, which is a national organization that convenes over 20 organizations uh, throughout the country uh, to that does civic engagement and uh, community engagement, social justice work within the communities, all youth led organizations. And also, uh, we uh, received a grant through the city of Columbus through the human service grant for a two-year grant uh, to support our Columbus community action team program uh, and so what we've done been doing is we started off at hosting events um, event based uh, doing a youth summit our first youth summit was in 2015 so we're, oh, we're, our, we're on our fifth annual youth summit uh, it'll be save the date y'all because they all need to be there Saturday August the 29th is the day that uh, we're looking to do. I, mean, I hope we. I hope we. I hope it's better social distancing. I mean, it's oh, all. It's the, gonna be a drive. Yeah. It's just gonna be a drive. I mean, I might, I might it's just gonna be a drive. It's gonna be a drive through a big social distance uh, drive, uh, resource drive for young people. And how can they but reach? Most of short. More about the, if they want to learn more, what's the? Where do they go? Or where do they oh, call? So, to learn more about it, uh, visit uh, 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 thinkmakelivesyouth.org. Or follow us on uh, Think Make Live Youth on Facebook, uh, TML Youth, uh, Instagram. Uh, yeah, we've been out here doing doing the work. So long story short, we went from, and I know I got twenty seconds left, ten seconds, but uh, we went from Five seconds. <laughs> we went from an event based organization to now, due to the pandemic and COVID nineteen, we really have to shift onto an online platform. So we're looking to launch a, a summer online program uh, at the end of July. Uh, and we're doing a pilot uh, through the summer, and then we'll be an online engagement throughout the school uh, school year. So look forward man, to seeing. I, I can't wait to see more, man. I know I know last night's been tough for me to get on the agenda with my schedule, but we'll work something out, man. It's good to see you thriving and doing well and having an impact. He does have a great story, and if you if you don't know, you should get online and check him out. Terry Green, Think Make Live, and uh, he's doing some really good things. So uh, Al, now Al, you were like. You know, fifty hats. I was like that guy right. in the hood that does everything, man. He got backpacks to be passed out to the kids. If you need some money, if your business is struggling with rent or or whatever, if you just need your tires changed or your oil changed, you know, Al can do it all, man. So, Al, tell us a little bit about your organization that you've kind of been getting going, why you started, okay. and what else you do in the business world. Right. Well, I'm just going, to, you know, making Google in the difference, but. My, uh, my thing is proud of is uh, during the pandemic, I uh, was able to raise money, help 13 barbershops and beauty shops combined uh, with their rent and essentials when they opened back up. And so that was a big accomplishment uh, with Help You United Way as well. And many of the donations that came from Facebook and through the GoFundMe page. So we were help, able to help those businesses sustain uh, for a short while with their rent and o open up with the thermometers and everything they need to get, uh, get started. Um, lastly, but not least, um, I did my Culture Wall Music Festival concert last week in a private location, and it's going to show virtual this Sunday, I mean, this Saturday, on um, the Culture Wall Music Festival Facebook page and on my Facebook page and on YouTube. Um, it's a festival that we started to help celebrate people in their, uh, the community uh, for all their accomplishments uh, on the, the people who are on the wall. And so we're going to keep that going. Um, I was kind of disappointed this year that we weren't able to have it in the park, but I understand. But the virtual experience is it's going to be really tight. We had the Deal Breakers, we had Bobby Floyd, and we had a gospel uh, band that uh, played uh, last Sunday. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the air 
Uh, I'm excited about that. And right now, man, I'm doing this right here. Okay. I'm trying to get people to do absentee. So we're doing a, I sent you an email. We're doing an absentee ballot canvas, application canvas. And basically we want people to um, pick up absentee ballots from me. I mean, not absentee, yeah, the absentee um, um, registration form from me. And then take it out to their check and see if anybody needs to fill out an absentee uh, registration. Um, the earlier we get them in, the earlier we get them out. And so um, I have um, friends in Lucas County, Toledo, Hamilton County. We're all going to launch this next Saturday from 9. You're going to see people out in your neighborhood. I've been working with Ed Leonard to make sure um, our seniors get these applications because it's important because they're not going to go out because of COVID-19. And a lot of people, man, um, you to be amazed that you know, barbers, people are starting to sign these absentee ballots mm -hmm. because we don't know what's going to happen here. Um, this is a, a nonpartisan um event we're gonna have a press conference tomorrow at past lamar's church is talking about the purpose of it um uh, we just want to ohio rock the vote 2020 and we just want to push people into doing the right thing and being safe while they vote and then the safest way to vote right now you can vote from your home by just filling out this application and mailing it in and that's what we're doing right now and i just thank god for the vision to get it out get it out early because nobody's talking about it by the time we talk about it it's gonna be too late and so we just want to make sure people are safe while voting. Well, well, Al, you didn't say anything about the census stuff you do. I told y'all he he does so much he don't even know remember all of it. But you didn't talk well, about the census stuff. We do, we do a lot. I wasn't finished. What? I wasn't finished. Yep. Oh, oh, go ahead. We, go ahead. We're go going ahead. to have this. We're going to census hand out. I talked to your assistant yesterday, and we're going to be having a census in our packages. Yep. Okay. And then also, guess what? I I I am. Um, they called me for to help do the census in my neighborhood, man. So I'm gonna be on the ground floor again. Man, I got tuition, man. I got two boys. Hey, college, hey I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man. Me too. Bruh, hey, hey, you got any school. more jobs that I can do? You and got anything I can do? Because yeah. I, I need something too, man. Seriously, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but no, I, I, you know, it, you know, people always look at folks with elected official titles as leaders in the community. These brothers are the real leaders. Th this is where things really happen, you know, myself, and I know I speak for Congresswoman Beatty and, and my man Shannon Harden over city council, and even the mayor, when I say, you know, we look to these folks, when, when things are really happening in the community, you know where to go, you know where to support and put resources. And so, man, you guys are just all amazing and doing great things. Before I, I turn over to my man, uh, Sean, uh, let me just say, uh, uh, Gail gave me some statistics on Franklin County. Right now, we're only at a 62% return rate on our census. So imagine if your paycheck, you only got 62% of it. You know, mm. imagine how much would be missing, how you would feel that. That's where we are as Franklin County right now if we don't get our own numbers in. And so the work you're gonna be doing out over the next few weeks, and I wanna encourage both Terry and Sean, everybody listening to do your part. And it's easy, you just go to 2020census.gov, that's 2020census.gov, and you can fill out, it's not even 10 questions, it takes like, five minutes to do you you if you get a glass of water and you go log in you won't even finish your glass of water before you finish the the uh the census questions that's how easy and simple it is if you don't have the internet you can also call uh toll free at 844-330-2020 that's 844-330-2020 it's easy it takes less than 10 minutes and it matters it matters and it makes a difference let me give a quick shout out to Stephanie Hightower from the Columbus Urban League, our president and CEO. Thank you for everything you do, representing the voice of the community on so many levels. Bob Lighty, thank you so much for joining us too. We're grateful to have you in the audience. And then, you know what? My fellow, my colleagues are on today. I wanna thank Commissioner Marilyn Brown and Commissioner John O'Grady. I'm telling you, there can't be two better partners that I could possibly have. We're like a, a three-headed monster that that works together so well, and we don't agree on everything. And it ain't, you know, we, we sometimes we have to dig in on things. But when we come out, I know we all feel like we did the right thing for Franklin County, and we're, we're moving in the right direction. I love those guys. Thanks so much for joining me and your support, Sean. Tell us about where you are, man, and and, and the work that you do uh, with children, the the most important um, citizens in our residents in our community. Tell us about what you do and. And, uh, and where they fit in in this conversation around census and all these things. Oh, I got to unmute you. 
Sorry. Let's unmute you. Got it. There you go. There you go. You muted yourself again. Hold on. Don't touch nothing. Don't touch nothing. I got you. Now do it. Now, now, now hit it, Sean. Now hit. You got to hit your mute. You got to hit your mute, Sean. All there right. There you go. There Sorry you go. Nobody touch nothing. <laughs> Nobody touch anything. But um, I mentioned earlier some of the statistics around the census. But just for for, for clarity's sake, um, I represent Franklin County Children's Services. Um, we're the agency, uh, the child welfare agency mandated by federal and state law to ensure the, the safety and well being for the children of our community. Um, one of the things that I uh, am proud to report is that a majority of the children that we serve are served in their own home. And uh, when that's not possible, then we seek out kin, uh, family members to, to take on that responsibility. And we engage thoughtfully in um, resolving whatever challenges might be presenting the family. Yeah. Um, and, and why the census is so important is because uh, in many cases, the resources needed to be able to provide the safety and security of our children can be provided by virtue of our completion of the census and the allocation of resources that can be pointed towards our most vulnerable community. And, and so I think it's important to note that um, the work that we are doing, we do it in combination and in, 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 in collaboration with our community. We think child safety is a community responsibility. We are a part of that community. We are willing to engage and have thoughtful dialogue around how we provide those services better. Um, and then I also believe that we, uh, um, we can respond to the need, the unique needs and lived experiences of our young people. Uh, my responsibility at Children's Services, uh, well, one of them is to, to serve as the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. And so, and what that means is our ability to unpack the unique lived experiences of, our, of all our constituents not only our internal staff, but also the community that we serve. And so uh, we do that in partnership, we do that in collaboration, and we do that hopefully to improve outcomes for all. And Al had to dip off, he had to go. So uh, we wanna thank him for co coming in. You know, we got four minutes and, you know, um, again, I wanna say just thank you to you guys. You represent the best that we have to offer in Central Ohio, and I really mean that. I see potentially three elected officials in the future in front of me. And I, I just think that now, now I, especially you, I'm coming after you, man. It's all a matter of time. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. But, but, but I mean that when I say that, because you got to find people who, whose heart is in the right place and who value this community in a way that goes beyond the job. And, and the three of you are just at the top of the heap, if you, if you ask me, in terms of what you bring to the table. And I, I appreciate you and love you. Um, within these last three minutes, one minute, you can say anything you want to the public. Uh, you can say, you know, what, what would you say to the listening audience now, uh, whether it's about hope, whether it's about effort or voting or, or census, what, what's your sort of final uh, comments? And uh, maybe Al, I know you got to run, so let me start with you. Uh, you know, Al's a man of many, many things, so let's, let's give Al the floor for a minute. Let me unmute you, sorry. Okay. Get out and make sure you get out and make sure you get out. Oh no. Do we uh, lose do the census is very important for our community. Uh, if you don't if you don't help us, we're gonna fail. We're gonna still be in the same situation 10 more years now. And we wanna make sure we leave a legacy for our children coming up. And uh, I just wanted to say get out and vote as well. And the census is the most important thing right now that, that, that you know that we need to get done. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Hey, good luck on that college tuition, man. If you got any left over, give it to me and I can help me help me pay my salary. Right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Take All care, right. bud. Terry? Yeah, uh, I would say get on the boat. Um, also, uh, make sure you do your senses. But my, my last one is just um, stay encouraged. Uh, I know during times like this, there's a lot of challenges. There's people that, that have been suffering, you know, from uh, many losses from the pandemic. Um, and then here we are in terms of this whole racial justice movement right after, um, you know, there's a lot of people that's going through a lot of mental health issues um, and those mental health issues are, are lead to, um, you know, some people even hurting themselves or using drugs or putting yeah. themselves in harmful situations. And so my words right now is just hoping for people just to stay encouraged 
um, to just, you know, that during this time right now, I know it can be, you know, challenging, it can be hard. And even hearing some of the things that we said today, you know, can be a challenge, but in the same sense, like we got to push through this. And, and, and we're gonna make it. Thanks, man. Uh, Sean, bring us home. Last final words. We have to insert ourselves into the discussions in very intentional ways. It's the requirement that comes with being anti-racist, and it's uh, a recognition that this is bigger than us. Uh, our societal obligation is to engage in these efforts always. I got more, but I'm gonna stop there because I know your time is running out. You see, he looked at the clock. I, I appreciate you for that. I, I'm not sure there's much um, I can say uh, than what these three uh, great men have said. And, and I'm just so grateful that you took time out of your schedules to join me on the show. I'm gonna ask those who are watching and listening uh, to join us at the same time, same place next week. We've got Kyle Strickland from the Kerwin Institute, among others. Looking forward to that young man. He's definitely a rising star. I'm looking forward to having him around and talking about some things. Uh, but I want to encourage you all to call in, send us your questions, send us your thoughts and suggestions about folks. And uh, we'll be here same time, same place, race, health, and wealth, a brotherly conversation. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Bye. Thank you.